Hey everyone, I'm Allison Morris, You're watching NBC News Now. Here's what's happening. This is historic progress, pulling our economy out of the worst crisis in 100 years. President Biden celebrating the June jobs report, 850,000 new jobs to be exact. What the president says he'll do next to help boost the economy even more. U.S. troops leaving Bagram Airfield, what that means for our withdrawal from Afghanistan. Plus, she wowed the world, winning the women's 100 meter at the U.S. Olympic trials. Now Shakari Richardson is saying she's sorry for failing a drug test. Sitting here, I, I just say, don't judge me because I am human. I'm, I'm you. I just happen to run a little faster. The big question now, will she still get a chance to shine at the Tokyo Games? We start tonight with the president and the economy. NBCNews.com senior White House reporter Shannon Pettypiece here with me now. Shannon, the president doing a victory lap today on those June jobs numbers. What's he saying, though, about keeping this momentum going and further growing this economy? Well, he is saying that this is evidence that his economic policies are working, particularly that $1.9 trillion COVID relief package that sent out added unemployment benefits to people, added additional resources to get the vaccine out to more Americans and sent some money to state and local governments. So he's saying that this is proof that that strategy working is working and that it's support uh, for the plans he has going ahead. Here's a little bit more of what he had to say. Again, it's a direct result of the American Rescue Plan. And at the time, people questioned whether or not we should do that, even though we didn't have bipartisan support. Well, it worked. Now, at the time, as he mentioned, Republicans suggested that those unemployment benefits would keep people on the sidelines and that that extra cash uh, would spur inflation. Uh, he is saying we're not seeing an indication of that yet. And he also put in a plug for his infrastructure plan, this $600 billion bipartisan deal that he's trying to get through Congress, saying that that is needed as well to help keep this momentum going. Shannon, the president announcing the child tax credit checks will start showing up this month. That's great news for a lot of folks. How much money are we talking about here uh, and how long will those checks be coming for? Well, people who qualify and that a lot of middle class families will qualify for these checks will be able to get thirty six hundred dollars for each child under six years old. And then for kids between six and 17, they get an additional three thousand dollars. And rather than getting that all in uh, one check at the end of the tax period when you file your taxes, the administration is rolling that out mm -hmm. on a monthly basis. So the president basically said, if you are a middle class family with two young children, you can expect to start getting a $600 check in the mail every month for the next 12 months as part of this program, which was, again, included in that $1.9 trillion COVID relief package. Uh, Shannon, this was interesting today. During her press briefing, Secretary Jen Psaki took a question about reports that some of Vice President Harris's staffers are claiming they work in an abusive environment. Tell us about that report and what Psaki said on that. So this is based off of a Politico, uh, Politico report. Uh, it was mostly citing unnamed people who worked for the vice president or former administration officials. Yeah, who said that it was a, uh, some describing as a hostile work environment, an unorganized work environment that a number of staffers uh, have already left. Uh, Jen Psaki, as you mentioned, was asked about this in the briefing. Here's what she had to say. I will say that uh, the vice president is an incredibly important partner to the president of the United States. She has a challenging job, a hard job, uh, and she has a great supportive team of people around her. Uh, but other than that, I'm not going to have any more comments on those reports. Okay. And the vice president's office did respond in that Politico report, essentially saying that it is a big job. And if some people anonymously want to complain, um, you know, that's their prerogative. But that, you know, they stand by the vice president in the way she's been running her office. All right, Shannon Pettypiece, thanks so much. Have a great weekend. You too. We're going to head out to Surfside, Florida, where we have an update on the search and rescue efforts at the condo collapse there. NBC News correspondent Sam Brock joining me now from the scene. Uh, Sam, what is the latest there? If I understand correctly, uh, there may have been a pretty big announcement about what they plan to do with the building. 
So I wouldn't say there are major material changes today. And, and Allison, good evening. Good to be with you. The two biggest pieces of information that we just learned, one is they uncovered two more bodies. We didn't get any more information about how old they were, who they might be. But that now brings the death toll to 22 officially and the unaccounted for number 126. The other major news that came out of this, or at least interesting news in terms of the conversations we've been having about demolition, is that Mayor Danielle Levinkov assigned an emergency declaration that allows for the demolition of the remainder of the building. Now, that does not mean, Allison, they're about to do it. We've heard already from engineers it's going to take weeks to evaluate their best options, figure out the strategy. What this does, though, is green lights the process. So when engineers do have consensus on what the best way to do it is in terms of demolishing the building, they now have official approval. That mechanism has already been ignited, if you will, from the mayor's office. So that just happened. But they say they are continuing search and rescue operations, which for so many folks here, toward the end of day nine, we're wondering, when are they start going to be making that pivot toward perhaps a recovery, given these unbelievable conditions that everyone has been working through? But the mayor's talking points of this have been consistent. And right now, Friday night, going into this weekend, are exactly the same. The search and rescue component continues as there are 126 people still unaccounted for. Allison? Sam, it is incredible uh, that they continue to hold out hope that they might find uh, some people alive in that rubble, and, and we certainly hope that they do. Uh, any, any other concerns, any other updates uh, from the mayor, any other officials uh, about the hurricane heading that way? We know Elsa has gained in strength, and there are some concerns that that could be uh, an issue for those search and rescue teams. Uh, what did you hear on that today? Sure. So they addressed it. Uh, we only heard Mayor Danielle Levine Kava speak. I'm not sure if there were any other remarks following that, but she reminded folks mm -hmm. there is a hurricane coming. Right now it's at 85 mile an hour sustained winds. We'll see if that holds as it approaches Florida. But right now, South Florida is directly in the cone of concern, and that would be Surfside as well. But for the general population, she warns them to make sure you have plenty of food and water, seven days provisions. As we do know that hurricanes, even a category one, can be incredibly disruptive. What it means for this situation right here, as we were talking about earlier, they've decided to pull out some of the tools and some of the vehicles that have been used, but the light machinery and the crews, as of right now, Allison, are staying where they are, on site, continuing search and rescue. The biggest disruption would obviously be strong winds, but in addition to that lightning, they have to stop as soon as there are any lightning within two and a half miles, a radius of where we are right now, okay. and suspend operations. And that is talking to search and rescue crews earlier today. They told me it was a mm -hmm. gut punch when they had to suspend operations for 14 or 15 hours. That was the exact phrasing that was used. Certainly, if that has to happen again this weekend or early next week, you'll be seeing a similar reaction. Allison. Their incredible commitment, their incredible work continues there in spite of the weather concerns and all the issues they are dealing with. It's just uh, amazing what those search and rescue teams are doing. Sam, thanks so much for the update. You got it. Thanks, Allison. The National Weather Service out with an update on Elsa, the first hurricane of the season in the Atlantic. So let's get right to NBC News meteorologist Bill Karens. Uh, Bill, what's the latest on Elsa? Yeah, I just got done reading all the new information from the National Hurricane Center. For the most part, there's not a lot of changes in intensity or forecast guidance of where it's headed. There's just some minor things that we're worried about that we're watching. And, you know, in the next couple of days, we'll figure out the exact details. So let me just give you the latest details from the Hurricane Center. Still at 85 mile per hour winds. That's a pretty strong middle of the ground category one hurricane. It's still flying. As far as hurricanes go, this one is moving very fast. It's right now about south of the Virgin Islands. This morning is near Barbados. So this storm is going to rocket through the Caribbean over the next 24 hours. So this is where the path it's going to take. It looks like Puerto Rico, you're safe, you're fine. Dominican Republic, I think you're going to be okay. Just some large waves on the southern coast. But the storm could potentially make a direct landfall on the southern tip there of Haiti as we go into late Saturday night, early Sunday morning. If not, then it will make its way towards the southern coast of Cuba, just to the north of Jamaica during the morning hours on Sunday. Notice the cone. It could be all along the peninsula of Cuba or it could be to the south coast. If it's south of Cuba, for the most part on Sunday, it'll be a stronger storm. If it's over land longer, there's a lot of mountains, it'll come off a weaker storm. So if you're in Florida, 
Unfortunately for the people in Cuba, you're hoping that the storm is over Cuba most of the day because you'll deal with a weaker storm. If it's not and it's over water longer, you may have to deal with a stronger storm. So that's one of the things we'll watch Sunday into Monday. And here's the new forecast for Florida. You'll notice that Miami and Freeport and NASA, you're almost not in the cone of uncertainty anymore. It doesn't mean this couldn't shift over the next couple of days. But if anything, we are favoring the western track more towards the west coast of Florida, possibly up towards the Panhandle, Apalachicola, Tallahassee areas. Notice only a tropical storm. I say only because of the huge storms we've dealt with in years past. A tropical storm moving quickly will have a little bit of water rise, some problems with wind, but not a lot of rain because it'll be moving so quickly. So that would be a positive with a fast moving tropical storm. But one of our computer models still has it becoming a category two or three near the coastline of Florida. So it's not etched in stone that we'll have to deal with a weaker storm. We don't want to be fooled by that. Here's our computer models, Allison. All of these squiggly lines, we'll be watching them over the next couple of days. Notice a majority of them are on the west coast of Florida, but there's still a couple that are off the east coast of Florida. So we're not going to let our guard down. We'll watch this one. Right now, this doesn't look to be a huge impacting storm. But of course, when you, know, when you have a situation like in Surfside, uh, that kind of changes the yeah. equation. Yeah, it certainly does. All right, Bill, how about the rest of the country this holiday weekend? Will we get to the beach here in the northeast? And, and how's it looking everywhere else? I mean, I can fly you somewhere to the beach if you want. I mean, there's plenty of gorgeous beaches in other Please places. Do. <laughs> <laughs> Please do. So we haven't talked a lot about the West since the beginning of the week and the incredible heat. It hasn't really gone away. I mean, it's still yeah. hot. It's not like off the charts hot, but it's still today about 100 in Billings, 102 in Boise. Temperatures are still running about 5 to 15 degrees above average. Saturday is going to be another day just baking in the sun from Medford to Boise. Look at North Dakota, 100 in Bismarck, even Minneapolis at 94. And the heat, if anything, will expand into next week. We're going to talk a lot more about another heat wave coming to the west. You know, once we're done with Elsa, we'll probably be talking once again about the west and the drought and the heat because we're expecting more records later in the uh, a week as we after the fourth holiday. So for Saturday, there's Allison's hit and miss showers and storms. So she'll spend inside organizing her uh, her drawer and her, her messy drawer. And then uh, the downpour is on Saturday afternoon and evening <laughs> down along the Gulf Coast. Uh, on Sunday, the sunshine will return you know, to the Northeast. That's the day we head to the beach on the East Coast. Midwest looks great. Fourth of July there forecast looks pretty good, Allison. Yeah, there it is. Uh, temperatures Great. are comfortable. I don't think many, I don't think, I, I'm almost going to go on record that I doubt any fireworks show will be rained out. I'm that confident that we're looking pretty awesome. nice coast to coast. Awesome. And, and Bill, I just have to say, and this is a little plug, please watch MSNBC from 2 to 3 p.m. tomorrow. I'll be filling in there. And I'm so glad I agreed to fill in tomorrow. Excellent. The weather's going to stink. I'll be free and good to go on Sunday for the fireworks. So thanks. This works out terrific. Well done. Well done. Thanks, Bill. Have a great weekend. The good news. People are traveling in record numbers this 4th of July weekend. They're getting out there. They're having some summer fun. The bad news, that travel is going to be pretty expensive. Here's NBC News correspondent Tom Costello. Yeah, hey, Allison, so the bottom line, this is going to feel more like a Thanksgiving holiday getaway. We have packed roads and very full airports right now. People are going to be paying more for gas, more for hotels, more for rental cars. And in the airports, you're not going to have much elbow room. Pick your favorite travel theme song. Hit the road, Jack. Fly away. Proud Mary. America is humming along in post-COVID escape mode. Travel this weekend projected to be the second heaviest ever. Of the nearly 48 million of us who are traveling, 91% going by car. The top getaway destinations, Orlando, Anaheim, Denver, and Vegas. The bad news is at the pump. July 4 going to be pricier. Americans going to have to dig deeper to the tune of 10 to $20 every tank. Gas prices are now averaging 3.12 a gallon nationally, the highest in 7 years amid the economic rebound, but higher in some states. Last July 4th, we paid 2.17 on average. I was filling it up with about $30 and now I'm filling it up with about 30, uh, $60, 65. 
so it's it's double the price now. A shortage of fuel truck drivers could lead to some isolated gas shortages in places. Meanwhile, mid-range hotel prices are also higher, up 35 percent or more. Rental car rates up 86 percent. Been on a plane or in an airport lately? Definitely feels weird coming back into the airport, um, but I'm excited. My the TSA is screening two million passengers a day now, mostly leisure travelers. We were all standing there like shoulder to shoulder, waiting to board. It's only raising the temperature on board some flights, with the FAA reporting a record number of incidents of bad, even unsafe behavior on board planes, fights, many over the existing mask requirements. New this morning, the FAA is unveiling a new public relations campaign with kids urging adults to behave. I think it's very disrespectful. You could distract the pilot if it gets that bad. That is so unsafe. Patience. Yeah, 3,200 reports so far from the airlines to the FAA of bad, even dangerous behavior on board planes. 3,200. In all of last year, there were 180. Now, correspondent Priscilla Thompson is here. She's going to give us one last round of the headlines from NBCNews.com. And then, Priscilla, we're going to sail off into the weekend. How's that sound? Cannot wait, Allison. Uh, we are kicking things off this hour with some news from the Supreme Court. They have decided they won't be taking up the appeal case of Baronelle Stutzman, a Washington state florist who was fined after she refused to sell flowers to a gay couple for their wedding, citing religious reasons. The move leaves the state court rulings against her intact. And the U.S. economy gaining 850,000 jobs in June, according to the latest report by the Bureau of Labor Statistics. That's higher than the 700,000 jobs predicted by economists and is a sign that the nation's economic recovery is building momentum. The Transportation Department will be proposing that airlines refund fees on checked baggage if they're not delivered to passengers quickly enough. This means if you don't get your bags within 12 hours on a U.S. flight or within 25 hours after an international flight, you get your money back. A department official saying if approved, it could take effect by next summer. India's official death toll from the coronavirus passing 400,000, but experts say the actual number could be 1 million or even higher adding that there is a possible third wave of infections coming. Officials say just 6% of all eligible adults in the country have been vaccinated. One municipality in Melbourne, Australia, is cracking down on cat roaming, introducing a new 24-hour cat curfew this October that will require owners to keep their cats on their property at all times. Officials say it's needed because cats are at a much higher risk of illness and injury if allowed to roam unsupervised. So no more late nights for those cats, Allison. Yeah, don't leave those cats unsupervised. You got to look out. That's Priscilla, right. thanks so much. Have an awesome weekend. You too. <laughs> Some great news for families with sick loved ones. Hospitals around the country are slowly getting back to more normal visitation. Some doctors even saying they need to do it faster. Here's MSNBC medical contributor Dr. Vin Gupta. As hospitals reopen to visitors again, a hodgepodge of visitation policies is causing confusion and frustration. They'd say, wait a minute, you can go in there safely. Why can't I? And I had to say, I don't have an explanation for you. I disagree with this policy. 16 months into the pandemic, doctors are learning how much family visits impact the actual health of patients. A recent study looked at delirium or extreme confusion in more than 2,000 critically ill COVID patients. It found family visits lower the risk of delirium by around 30%. Dr. Wes Ely is an ICU doctor at Vanderbilt and co-author of the study. Families are not a luxury in care and they're not an accessory. They are absolutely part of the treatment plan. Part of our prescription for healing needs to be family at bedside. 20-year-old COVID patient Daniel Amon was in the ICU in April. His mom, Diane, not allowed inside his room. I had no way to communicate my needs. Looking back on it, I don't really know how I got through the day-to-day -day of just sitting there and watching. She could stand outside his room, but only for two hours a day. If I had a loved one right now in that bed, could they hear me? 
They can't hear you, Dr. Gupta. And not only can they not hear you, but then they also miss the touch and the eye contact. So standing here outside this room, you, you might as well be on Mars. What about the role of technology? Could televisits be the solution? There's no doubt in my mind that we need to use these moving forward for people who want to meet with a loved one in another country, in another state, who they can't get to them quickly enough. But I don't want it to be a crutch or a substitute when we can have the families actually in the room. Once reunited for mother and son, the difference was clear. Having the emotional boost of like a familiar face that I could actually like touch and not just see on a screen. I'm fairly certain helped me get out of there a whole lot faster. Many experts are now calling on the government to set national standards for hospitals to make visits safer, less restricted, and more fair. Scientifically, we know how to do this. So to me, it is, uh, it is completely inappropriate anti-medicine and a threat to dignity of humans to keep these families separated from their loved ones. And to your point, this is actually a risk factor for death. I think it is. Dr. Vin Gupta live with me now. Uh, Dr. Gupta, you reported that uh, there that experts want the government to set national visitation standards to cut down on all this hodgepodge. Uh, what are the guidelines, if any, from the CDC? And, and what would you like to see as a universal standard here? Awesome. Thanks for highlighting this. You know, what we're seeing uh, is there's encouragement of getting families at the bedside. That's what the CDC says, aside from cases uh, that involve COVID patients, especially in ICUs, where it's really compassionate use, meaning end of life, essentially, exceptions can be made. And as Dr. Lee pointed out, who's an expert on this, uh, there is a life-saving benefit to having families in the room early on in the course of critical illness, especially in the era of covid and right now, we're not able to do that. I mean, you can have a situation where a hospital on one side of, of a city has one policy and just down the road, it might be an entirely different policy. So there needs to be that standardization about what is safe, what is not safe. And generally speaking, we'd like to align that if family members are fully vaccinated, they should be allowed into the hospital. You spoke to a doctor who called visits part of the treatment plan for COVID patients. What are hospitals doing to help facilitate those family visits? And do you think they're doing enough? You know, right now it's really it's a, it's a hybrid approach. Uh, myself, yeah. my colleagues were relying on technology, zooming in, FaceTiming in, you name it. But we want to move towards in person. Some hospitals uh, are moving faster than others. But again, the adoption of in person visits using a standardized approach, it would be helpful if CDC put out specific guidelines saying, if family members showed, say, proof of vaccination, they should be allowed with PPE to enter rooms, whether it was COVID positive or not. Yeah, you point out just how important it is uh, for families uh, to be with their their sick loved ones and vice versa. Uh, Dr. Gupta, thanks so much for your reporting today. Really important stuff. Thank you. Nearly 67 percent of American adults have at least one covid shot. But health experts warn this pandemic will not end until the rest of the world is vaccinated. NBC News correspondent Heidi Prisbella takes an inside look at the Biden administration's push to get vaccines to the countries that need them, like Colombia, where deaths and hospitalizations are skyrocketing. It's unlike any operation in the history of U.S. disaster response. The next few weeks, a sprint to export millions of vaccine across the globe. NBC has the first look inside this massive operation. 2.5 million doses of Johnson & Johnson vaccine receiving a Colombian military escort from Memphis to Bogota. This is the first time I've really had the opportunity to impact the entire globe. So there are a lot of differences with a domestic emergency response than there is in something like this with an international shipment. You know, looking at being able to move vaccine, life-saving vaccine through a cold chain system to another country and all of the legal hurdles as well as the domestic hurdles of moving it through our transportation system onto an aircraft. The situation in Colombia is dire, with millions falling into poverty and just about 13 percent of the population vaccinated. The president announced two weeks ago a full reopening of the economy. Now, Colombia has among the worst death rates in the world, hospitals at capacity sparing no one, many of them young. We're like uh, New York was or, or Italy April of last year. 
we're having around 700 uh, people dying every day. Uh, infections are spiking. We hope that in a month uh, they'll start coming down again. Yet with new, more dangerous variants spreading, questions remain about whether the vaccines are coming soon enough. The Biden administration's policy has been to first secure enough doses for every American over the age of 18. Yet with the Delta variant now gripping much of the world, some countries, including India, have been critical that the U.S. didn't act sooner, with millions of unused doses due to expire in some states. Now the U.S. is donating 75 percent of the vaccine through COVAX, a coalition including the World Health Organization, and it has pledged another 500 million doses beginning in August through next year. Until now, the Chinese have been dominant in Colombia and other developing countries, often dubbed their vaccine diplomacy. But the clinical data on the Chinese vaccine's efficacy remains opaque, and some countries relying on them have seen cases rise again. In uh, January and February, when uh, we weren't receiving vaccines because of logistical problems from Pfizer and from Moderna and from AstraZeneca, which was the one we bought, uh, we had to rely on Chinese uh, uh, Sinovac. And I started pushing again uh, donations. And finally, when, uh, when the U.S. announced that it was going to uh, uh, lend uh, AstraZeneca to Canada and uh, Mexico, I started pushing really hard. The Biden administration tells NBC that it has shipped half of the 80 million doses it's pledged to donate worldwide. To put that in perspective, to vaccinate 70 percent of the world's population, effectively reaching herd immunity, it would take 11 billion doses. American forces leaving Bagram Airfield today, uh, raising even more concerns about the Afghan forces' ability to fight the Taliban. NBC News Chief Foreign Correspondent Richard Engel has the latest from Kabul. Allison, today was a seminal moment in the history of America's longest war. For the first time in nearly 20 years since American troops first came to this country after 9-11 to hunt down Osama bin Laden, uproot al-Qaeda and the Taliban, American troops have left Bagram Air Base, which is outside of Kabul. They've left many uh, bases over the last several days and weeks as American troops are drawing down. But it raises questions about the future of this country. Will the Afghan government be able to hold on without American support? American troops cleared out of Bagram, their biggest base in Afghanistan, without celebrations or fanfare. The U.S. is shutting down its longest war extremely quietly, not announcing how or when troops are leaving for their safety. This isn't a victory lap, but a stealth move out the door after nearly 20 years. When Osama bin Laden masterminded 9-11 from Afghanistan, the United States quickly invaded and in just weeks overthrew the Taliban, which had been protecting him. Starting off small, the war dragged on and grew. More than 750,000 American troops rotated through, 2,442 died here. But a new war may be starting now as Americans leave. Some Afghan security units are collapsing, surrendering to a resurgent Taliban. The Taliban's official propaganda channel shows in confirmed events, Afghan soldiers and police turning themselves in, handing over small bases. The Taliban even give them pocket money for transportation home, demoralizing. The American general tasked with shutting down this war isn't painting a rosy picture. What we're seeing is the uh, you know, rapid loss of, of district centers, although the Afghan security forces have actually gained some of those back in uh, certain parts of the country. A return of the Taliban would be catastrophic for millions of Afghan women. When the Taliban were in power, they banned women going to school, declaring it un-Islamic. Women were whipped and stoned for crimes like adultery. Under 20 years of American protection, a generation of Afghan women and girls flooded into schools and the workplace, and they fear returning to the Middle Ages. And it is not just Afghan women and girls. There are thousands of Afghan translators who worked side by side, in some cases fought side by side with American troops against the Taliban. They worry that as the Americans leave and the Taliban become more and more dominant in their positions, that these translators could be hunted down and killed. 
Uh, President Biden has promised to find a solution to repatriate many of them to the United States, but the details of that program are still unclear and the translators are still here. The Boy Scouts of America reaching an $850 million settlement with tens of thousands of sexual abuse victims. It is the largest settlement in a child sex abuse case in U.S. history. In May, NBC News Now correspondent Issa Gutierrez spoke with former scouts who are a part of that suit about their abuse. And just a warning, you may find their accounts disturbing. That man uh, picked me up for a scouting uh, outing, I suppose a weekend camp out thing, gave me drugs and alcohol, um, and I woke up being sexually assaulted in his home. That was the last time I was uh, involved in scouting. There was constant banter amongst the senior staff about, are they available? Um, boy, that would be a good catch. Um, uh, uh, wow. I thought if I told anyone about it, I would be the one getting punished. We're talking about something that's lifelong. I mean, even for me, even though I'm in a good place, it still doesn't ever not come up in my life. It still does. You can watch TV and you can watch something on the news and you'll bring you right back to that moment when you were 11 and you're sitting in a room thinking, why am I in my underwear with an adult man? Like, why is this happening to me? What did I do to bring myself here? It's my suspicion that I was not the only one within the troop that was molested. I will say this, I am the only one that came out. I fell into a deep, deep depression, um, especially, you know, once it was out and I was teased, it, you just kind of reach a breaking point to how much you can take. And for me, it was deep depression, a suicide attempt, and I think it's such a common story for a lot of survivors. There was the first year where I went off to college and just had panic attacks consistently and reached a point where I had to check myself into a psychiatric ward because I was starting to have suicidal ideation. And most recently, on Christmas Day of this past year, I actually attempted it. That timeline has been following me every single step of the way because I, how, how do you grapple with that type of stuff? How do you get used like a, not even like a person? You're just an object at that point. How, how can you reconcile with that? The Boy Scouts of America calling this settlement a significant step forward, saying this agreement will help local councils make their contributions to the trust without additional drain on their assets and will allow them to move forward with the national organization towards emergence from bankruptcy. Ken Rothweiler, an attorney representing nearly 17,000 survivors, saying this is just a start. Ken joins me now, uh, and, and we're so appreciative of your time today, Ken. You represented sure. the largest group in this lawsuit. Many of your clients abused when they were teens, most of them now in their 60s and 70s. How are they reacting to this settlement? Well, they're somewhat satisfied, although they're not obviously completely satisfied. And as you said, this is the largest settlement for sure. child sex abuse cases in the United States. But it's just a down payment. It's just the tip of the iceberg. Because now what happens is we go after the insurance proceeds for part of this settlement because the BSA now has assigned their insurance rights into a trust, and we as the law lawyers now will negotiate with the insurance company. There is billions and billions and billions of dollars of potential insurance proceeds that we want to get so we can compensate the victims. Now, does that process start immediately? Uh, I don't know the legal ins and outs of all of this, but when does it start and how long could that take? It starts tomorrow, as a matter of fact. We're going to start talking with the insurers okay. because these victims need to get compensated immediately. Understand that most of these victims are in their 60s. This abuse happened 40 years ago, 50 years ago. Most of these young men that were uh, abused were in their early teens, between 11 and 14 years old. So there's times of wasting, and we need to get to work on this immediately. Do you have any sense of how long it could take, or, or is this a unique situation? You'll just have to see how it goes. Yeah, you kind of have to see how it goes. We would like to get a global settlement uh, by the end of the year, but it could take longer if some of the insurance companies won't settle with us, then we'll litigate against them. And, you know, that process takes a little okay. while. But uh, in the end, these victims will be adequately compensated. 
Ken, I know no compensation could ever make up for the trauma that your clients have been through, but what would you like to see the Boy Scouts do to make sure this doesn't happen again and to anybody else? Well, I think they're doing that. They put measures in place to assure themselves that this wouldn't happen again. The Boy Scouts have recognized that uh, what has been created here is uh, a, a mass amount of uh, Boy Scouts that have lifelong scars. These men that have uh, suffered this abuse, this, this abuse uh, and this thought of the abuse and the scar of the abuse will never go away. So the Boy Scouts recognize that and they want to make put themselves in a position where this never happens again. And I take them at the word. I think that's exactly what they're trying to do. Ken, great to have you on. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, and we hope that your clients and all the other uh, former Boy Scouts involved in this suit, that they get that compensation as soon as possible. Uh, possible. Really appreciate it. Thanks for having me, Allison. Track star Shakari Richardson's Olympic dreams in jeopardy. She is suspended for a month for failing a drug test. Richardson tested positive for THC. It's the chemical found in marijuana. She was a 100-meter favorite heading into Tokyo, dominating the U.S. Olympic trials just a week after her biological mother died. Richard talked about her suspension this morning in a Today Show exclusive. Shakari, I, I just want people to understand where you're coming from um, and tell me if if this is correct, but you, it was a few days before your big race and the trials, you found out that your biological mother had passed away. Um, you found out when a reporter told you, and it was after that that um, you had, it ingested some kind of marijuana. I, I should mention, you were in Oregon. It's legal in Oregon. You didn't violate any law, but it was against the rules of your sport. And as you said, you knew that. But is, is that what happened? Is that how this unfolded? Honestly, um, yes, that is the story. I had an interview scheduled with my agent. I knew I was having an interview. I knew um, going into an interview. Like, it was, I was just thinking it would be a normal interview. And then on the interview, to hear that information come from a complete stranger uh, was definitely triggering, was definitely nerve shocking because it's just like, how are you to tell me that? Like, you know, it's like, not, and not, no offense against him at all. He's just doing um, his job. But definitely that sent me in a state of mind, in a state of, of emotional panic, if anything. Mm. And still knowing that I still, even though I'm here, I still have to go out and put on a performance for, um, put up a performance for my dream, go out there and still compete. The, um Olympic officials, the U.S. track and field, the anti-doping agencies now have a decision before them. Um, unfortunately, you will not be able to compete in the Olympics in your in your race, your individual race, 100 meters. Um, but there is a chance. It's, it's a small chance, but there's a chance you could go to the Olympics and take part in the relay. Are you hopeful for that? Is that what you're holding out hope for at this moment? Right now, I'm just putting all of my time and energy into dealing with what I need to do with to heal myself. So if I'm allowed to receive that blessing, then I'm grateful for it. But if not right now, I'm going to just focus on myself. You know, um, what would your message be to those who are considering that right now, who are thinking about that, and to your fans, you know, who have fallen in love with you and were so proud of your performance and maybe crushed just as you are in that moment? What would you want to say to them? I would like to say to my fans, to my family, to my sponsorship, um, to the haters, too. I, I apologize as much as I'm disappointed. I know that when I swim on the track, I don't represent myself. I represent a community that has shown me great support, great love. And to y'all, I, I feel y'all. And so I apologize for the fact that I didn't know how to control my emotions or deal with my emotions during that time. Um, and to the... And what I would just leave with my fans, or I would just leave out there is that, like I tweeted and said yesterday, I'm human, we're human. Um, my statement, what I always say in my interviews, um, I want to be as transparent as possible with you guys, whether it's good, whether it's bad, but when it comes to Shakira Richardson, it's never been a steroid. It will never be a steroid attached to the name Shakira Richardson. The, charge and what the, the situation was was marijuana. I'm not encouraging anybody to do it. I'm not saying oh, don't do it or, or anything like that but if you choose to do things um, 
in your personal time or things like that you just should know or be aware of the consequences or just know or just find different ways to just cope or do what it is that you that will make you feel better but sitting here I, I just say don't judge me because I am human I'm, I'm you I just happen to run a little faster the majority of Americans think recreational medical marijuana should be legal, according to a recent Pew survey. And it's legal in some states, but the medical and recreational laws aren't necessarily in sync. Neither are the state and federal. Confused yet? I got you. Here's a breakdown of where the U.S. stands on marijuana. Marijuana legalization is sweeping the nation. In the past six months, New York, Virginia, New Mexico and Connecticut have legalized cannabis. But even as states test the waters with marijuana, on a federal level, it's still a Schedule I controlled substance. That means it's considered highly addictive with no medicinal value, and simple possession could get you arrested for a federal crime. So where does the U.S. actually stand on marijuana? Currently, medical marijuana is legal in 36 states, and 18 have legalized it for recreational use among adults. But people are still being arrested for marijuana possession. Generally speaking, arrests are on the downswing. Compared to 2016, there's been more than a 20% decrease in the number of marijuana possession arrests. But rates are still high. In 2019, the greatest number of arrests were for drug abuse violations. And of those arrests, about 32% or a little over 500,000 arrests were for marijuana possession, not even sales. That's more than the number of violent crime arrests that year. When we look at who is being arrested for drug possession generally, 26% are black people, despite black and white people using and selling drugs at a similar rate, according to the Drug Policy Alliance. Currently, an estimated 40,000 Americans are in prison for marijuana offenses, according to The Last Prisoner Project, a marijuana criminal justice reform group. But separate from the criminal justice costs, how are federal laws are holding up legalization practically? Well, in many ways, they're not. Legal cannabis sales topped $17 billion in 2020. But there are major hurdles due to federal prohibition. Cannabis companies are still seen as illegal in the eyes of the federal government. That means no federal aid and no deductions for business expenses, all while paying more than a billion dollars in local, state, and federal taxes. And research is a problem as well. Until recently, the National Center for the Development of Natural Products at the University of Mississippi was the only approved supplier of marijuana for research in the United States. But that will likely change soon. In May of this year, the Drug Enforcement Administration announced that pending review, it would work with new manufacturers to, quote, facilitate the production, storage, packaging, and distribution of marijuana under the new regulations for research. The U.S. Food and Drug Administration supports this clinical research by the medical community, but the path to federally approved drugs is not clear. According to the FDA website, the FDA understands that there is increasing interest in the potential utility of cannabis for a variety of medical conditions, as well as research on the potential adverse health effects from the use of cannabis. To date, the FDA has not approved a marketing application for cannabis for the treatment of any disease or condition. The agency has, however, approved one cannabis-derived drug product, Epidiolex, or cannabis oil, and three synthetic cannabis-related drug products. Despite resistance on the federal level, a majority of Americans support cannabis use. 60% of U.S. adults say that marijuana should be legal for medical and recreational use, and another 31% agree that it should be legalized for medical use. Fewer than 10% of people think it shouldn't be legal at all. Hey, NBC News viewers, thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Subscribe by clicking on that button down here and click on any of the videos over here to watch the latest interviews, show highlights and digital exclusives. Thanks for watching.